started tonight. Amen. Amen. Let's stand to our feet, go to the Lord in prayer. Isn't it nice and warm in here this evening? Amen. Amen. Let's pray some more folks in here while we're praying. How many believe God can do that? Yes. Seen him do it before. Amen. Father, we thank you today for the word that we heard on the preeminence of Jesus. God, there is not a greater message that could be spoken. There is nothing more wonderful that could be talked about than your wonderful son. And Lord, we just ask that tonight that the Holy Spirit of God would just fall on this place. Let your spirit have his way in this service tonight. Lord, touch this praise team as they lift up the name of Jesus. Let's they lift up their voices to you tonight. And God, do not let them be a people of entertainment. God, we haven't come to watch them worship. We haven't come to listen to them sing. God, we've come to worship you. We've come to bless you. We've come to magnify you. We've come to sing your praises and to glorify you. And so, God, I pray that you'll just pull all of us together tonight to do that one wonderful thing of magnifying your name. Lord, anoint this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Let's put your hands together for Jesus tonight. Come on, did you come to worship him? Hallelujah. Somebody say Jesus. Say hallelujah. All right, let's go into worship tonight.
here tonight. Yes, Lord. Are you standing on His promises? Come on, are you standing on His promises? Has there given you anything to stand on tonight? Hallelujah. Let's have a time of fellowship if we can. I want you to get out across the aisle. Shake the person's hand next to you. If you haven't spoken to someone yet tonight, shake their hand. Tell them it's good to see them in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah.
an able God tonight. Hallelujah. He's able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we could ask. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Say he is able. Thank you. 
this house tonight with your presence we need you Lord all boats rise on a on a rising tide Lord I just ask that you would fill this house tonight we pour our hearts out to you Lord house tonight. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Let's sing that how great is our God. The Spirit of the Lord is in this house tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We worship you tonight. tonight how great
voice, every voice, how great, how great. Oh, we bless you, Holy One of Israel. We bless you, Holy One of Israel. We bless you, I have placed my eye on you, says the Lord, and I have looked on you tonight, and I have observed your praise, and I have taken in your worship, and I say to you that I am pouring myself out on you, for with a pure heart you have praised me, and with the pure water of my spirit I shall place my name on you, says the Lord. 
I shall know you and you shall know me and you shall be known of me, says the Lord, and I shall be known of you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How great is our Lord. How great is our Lord. Hallelujah. Would you one more time from out of a heart of pure worship, would you just give him the praise that he deserves? Come on, bless him in this house. Bless him in this house. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 You may say, preacher, what you doing? I'm just waiting. Go ahead, Blake. see you in the house of the Lord tonight. To all of our home folks, we're glad you're here. And to any of our guests, we're glad you're here. We have Pastor Gunnels here with us tonight. It's so good to have her. Um, just stand up and give us a quick word for the Lord. Pastor Brandon Hudson is her son because they look more like brother and sister. But um, it's good to have Pastor Brandon and his, <laughs> and his family with us tonight. We're so glad to have them. And it's also good to have Brother Mikey Jensen with us tonight. And, um, I, I'm trying to decide. He, I asked him if he would sing for us. He said, well, I don't want to, but if you tell me to, I will. 
So, um, how many would you like to hear Mikey sing tonight? <laughs> Blake, would you mind moving that microphone over to the piano for him? And Mike, just come on up here and bless us tonight with the gift that God has given you. This young man can flat play a piano and sing, and we're just excited to have him with us tonight. So we're going to let him come and just whatever the Lord lays on his heart. So these guys can follow you. Amen. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. While they're getting ready for that, let me um, tell you, you probably have noticed that in your bulletins the last couple of Sundays, we have these cards. And um, they are simply trying to decide what you want to do in ministry. We have several different ministries here. And uh, we started off trying to appoint different people. And we thought, well, we better find out what people want to do. And um, so I'm going to tell you this. This is the deal I'm going to make with you. I want you to take these. I want you to check two of them. Two of them. If I don't get your name back and you had not checked one, or one of them at least, then I'm going to put you in a ministry. And it might be taking care of the nursery. So if there's ever been a motivation for you to check one, check one of these and then get it back to me. And we're, we're trying very hard to structure and get things together. I told you last Sunday, if we could ever get this church working, there is no stopping of what it could do. But we got to get up off the pew and roll our sleeves up and get to work for Jesus. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Brother Mike, you bless us tonight. Hey amen. I'm glad to be in the house of God tonight, aren't you? I'm glad to be safe, sanctified, and Holy Ghost filled and on my way to heaven. Um, I grew up in the Pampico Church of God and the Pentecostal Holiness Church. And um, there was a lady that used to come to the Pampico Pentecostal Holiness Church that was on the back side of my house before they moved to the new location. Um, her name was Sister Tiny Port. I don't know if y'all remember her, but uh, she used to sing an old song. And um, she had her hair stacked two feet on top of her head. And I used to love to see that thing we go on wobble, so I'm going to try one of them old songs that she used to sing. Well, I started out trapped for the Lord many years ago. You know I had a lot of heartache and met a lot of grief and woe. Oh, but when I would stumble, then I would humble down. I can say thank the Lord I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Oh no, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. I gotta make it to heaven somehow. No, the devil takes me and tries to turn me around. Church, you know he's all but everything that's got to me. All the wealth I want, the world and fame, and if I could still, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Well, there's nothing in the world that I ever take the place of God's love. All of the silver and gold can never buy one touch from above. When my soul needs healing and I begin to feel it, His power.
person I've ever seen out running was Brody Pope. He, <laughs> we had a, had a great, great time. I, um, how many of you enjoyed that word this morning? Boy, that, that powerful, the preeminence of Christ. I told somebody today at the funeral, says Dalton Mills, I said, man, you got to come hear this guy preach. She said, well, if you endorse him, I said, I was sitting there listening to him preach, thinking, Lord, I wish I could preach like that. That was some good preaching this morning. And um, we, we have really, really enjoyed already this great man of God. I'm looking forward to the other nights he's going to be with us and working um, in the labor of an evangelist. But it don't matter how powerful he preaches. It don't matter how much he prays. It don't matter how much he stays in the presence of God, fast, or whatever he does to get ready. If we're not here and we don't bring somebody with us that needs the Lord, then it will be in vain. And so I want us to work this week to get somebody that needs Jesus, somebody that needs the Lord in this house. Maybe they're not lost. Maybe they're saved, but they're going through a bad time. Maybe their heart has been broken. Maybe they're going through a divorce. Maybe their child just found out they had a disease that they don't know what to do about. Or maybe they're just having a rough time. I want us to get them here this week. I believe if we can get them here, God will save them. He'll clean them up. He'll sanctify them. He'll heal them. He'll encourage them. It's our job to get them here. Brother Snyder hadn't been around this area for a long time, so he really don't know anybody, so he can't get anybody here. But you and I can. We know folks. And so let's work this week to get people in the house of the Lord and ready to receive the word of the Lord. Father, as the people get ready to give tonight, Lord, I have tried to not ever pressure them in what to give. I've just wanted them to be obedient. I've just wanted them to obey you in their giving. Lord, I've never had to be embarrassed to give an evangelist a check at the end of the week. I've never had to be embarrassed at what this church has given. Not because they're rich, but because they're obedient. And Lord, I pray that tonight each of us will be obedient. Lord, you've already told me what I'm supposed to give, and I'm going to do exactly what you said. I'm going to do exactly what what you said, Lord. Father, that's what I ask of them, that they'll just do what you ask them to do. And then, God, I pray the spirit of generosity will be on them. God, I've got some big needs that only you can meet. And so I'm going to do what you tell me to do, believing that as I give, I'm sowing toward those needs being met. And I ask that this people do the same. In Jesus' name, and the church said, amen and amen. Given the offering tonight after you're through giving, and after they're through playing, the next voice you will hear will be that of our evangelist.
I'd like to tell you I taught him how to play the piano. But <laughs> great day in this world. My, my, my. Thank the Lord for his goodness. And aren't you glad that you can have a little talk with Jesus? Yeah. Praise his name. You don't have to get all concerned about how you put your prayers together. Um, he understands. The fact is, some of the most earnest of my praying has been those times when I couldn't even get English to come out of my mouth. I didn't know what to say. But the tears would flow. The heart was breaking. My soul was just lamenting, and I was poured out like a drink offering. And he knew what I was crying for. And he came by, and he touched me, and I thank the Lord for that. Bless his name. I, I'm enjoying this service. My, my, my. What, what great music and great vocalists and, and just a, a tremendous spirit in this house tonight. Amen. Amen. I don't know if it's always like this on Sunday night, but I'm glad it is this one. Amen. I'm glad that it's this way while I'm able to enjoy it together with you. I, Brother Tim, I believe that we create an atmosphere. I really do. To the degree that we respond to the presence and the moving of the Holy Ghost, he will continue moving. I've seen him move some places and some folks wouldn't, wouldn't get in. And he quit moving. And, you know, he, he'd try to do something, nobody do anything, and preacher couldn't buy an amen for a hundred dollar bill and, and and then they wonder you know why the church is dead and drying up and so forth but my the lord is in this place hallelujah. amen and we praise hallelujah. god for that hallelujah to his marvelous and holy name well, let me say thank you so much for your giving and whatever you do in that area to uh, bless my ministry and help me to do the work of an evangelist across this nation i want to say thank you from deep within my heart, I appreciate your kindness. I appreciate so very much. My brother Eddie and Sister Karen take me out to uh, lunch today, uh, enjoying the fellowship. Your pastor has had a busy day this day. And uh, if you've never pastored a church, then you, you probably don't have a clue um, what, what he has gone through this day. But sometimes uh, the weekend can look like all day Saturday, somebody keeps you running here and yonder you didn't get to pray and do like you wanted to do and then Saturday night you get a, an emergency call to the hospital and you've got to take off and I've gotten home about 6 30 or 7 on Sunday morning from an all night stint praying and weeping and trying to help folks in the emergency room and then you come in and you're trying to stay awake during Sunday school and trying to get your thoughts pulled together for the preaching service and and then that afternoon somebody's on death's door and that's just the way it goes and he's been very busy today and I appreciate so very much they're helping me out and spending some time with me and I appreciate the fact that uh, brother Tim uh, feels his liberty to just do what he needs to do in ministry and so we're, we're just in this thing together amen and isn't it great whenever we, we sow together we together, we harvest together, and we shout about it together, and thank the Lord for what he means to us in this place. I'm going to read tonight from 1 Kings chapter number 18. I want to do something that uh, you, you may think is a little out of, uh, uh, out of the way, but I don't mean it that way. My wife is accustomed to traveling with me. She is as vital a part of my ministry as the breath in my lungs. I, I depend so heavily on upon her. She is an excellent uh, vocalist and uh, pianist, and uh, she, she's quite a good preacher in her own right, and she's an excellent altar worker, and I miss her. Uh, that being said, the reason she does not travel with me at this time and this season of our ministry is because both of our moms are in their 80s, and everybody needs a little help now and then, all right? And so they're in that stage of life, and uh, my mom is in a long-term care facility in a wheelchair, and has a couple of broken vertebrae, so she needs a little help. And, and uh, my mother-in-law is 83, and she's in the process of selling her house and moving into an apartment. And so Miss Teresa has stayed behind during this season to uh, assist them where she's needed, and I appreciate that. Somebody asked me, Brother Tim, they said, is, is Teresa ever going to travel with you again? I said, that's the plan if Jesus tarries. However, it would be quite bitter and sweet because if she's traveling with me, then that means our moms are already gone to heaven and we won't keep them as long as we can. But my wife wants me to greet you. She doesn't know you, nor do you know her, but you would love her and she would love you. And she is a precious lady. And so I bring you her greetings and you rest assured, she is on her knees this week praying that God will bless you and that God will minister to you. And she's back there now saying, God, help that boy to preach. 
Uh, she, she gave me instructions. She said, you just preach when you get out there. And so I'm going to just try to do what my wife tells me to do. How many of you fellas think that's a wise position? All right, so I'm going to try just to preach tonight. And may the Lord bless us all. First Kings chapter number 18. Stand with me, please, as we honor the word of the Lord. I want to read from verse number 41. First Kings chapter 18, verse number 41. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. The sound of what does your Bible say? Abundance of rain. Father, bless your word. Bless your people. Touch your servant and receive glory under your name through all that we endeavor to say and do. In everything, may Christ be exalted. May the Holy Ghost have liberty to continue the good work that he has begun in us, in this place, in this hour tonight. God, we love you. And we bless you in the holy name of your Son, our Savior Jesus. And we all said amen. amen. And amen. God bless you. You may be seated this evening. <clears throat> this is a very familiar chapter of Scripture. And I want to preach to you tonight concerning this idea that there is an abundance of rain. There's an abundance in our God. God is not slack. And God is not lacking. And God's not running short. God has never been caught off guard. He's never been taken by surprise. He's never had to stand up on his throne and wipe his brow and twiddle his thumbs and say, what in the world am I going to do about this? God has what you and I have need of, and he's got plenty of it. Aren't you thankful for that? I'm grateful to God for the fact that there is an abundance. Now, whenever you hear that phrase, sound of abundance, you give no thought to the lack that is in your life. That just fades away. Whenever you're needing rain and you begin to hear the claps of thunder in the heavens, you stop thinking about the drought and you begin to think it's about to rain. So whenever there is a sound, somebody begins to think rain is on the way. You're not thinking how dry it is. You're not thinking about how parched your soul is. You're not thinking about anything other than God is about to break the drought and the spirit of our God is about to rain down upon us. The Bible gives us promise. God said he would pour out the rain, the former rain and the latter rain, that rain that comes right after the planting and right before the harvest. I'm convinced that God wants to pour out rain upon us sufficiently that the heavy downpours will cause the streams to start filling up again and the streams will begin to flow down into the creeks and the creeks into the rivers and the rivers will flow into the ocean and God will begin to draw those waters. I'm convinced that God wants to send us a rising tide. Amen. I don't know what it does for you to think about that but this afternoon God dealt with my heart whenever I read out of Ezekiel 47. That's not the message that I'm going to preach to you but I just got to get this off my heart and out of my mind. The further the man got from the house of God, the deeper the water became. The further down the road he got, the deeper the water was for him. I'd been living for Jesus since I was an eight-year-old boy. Fact is, if, if going to church could save you, my mom and daddy saved me. I mean, they, they took me to church before I was born, and they made me go to church after I arrived. They thought I needed to go three times every week, though I knew I wasn't that ungodly. But they thought that I needed to go Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Thursday night prayer meeting. And every night of the revival, they took me there. And, and I know somebody would say, well, you need to lay on a couch and look at ink blots. And, and let us tell you how you hate your parents. And I just want to say I'm glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I praise God for my upbringing. I have seen the 
rain fall. And the further down the road I get in my journey of living for Jesus, the deeper water I ought to be in. Amen. I'm not interested in being in hot water. I've been there a few times. I am interested in being in the waters that are deep enough to swim. God help us to find ourselves in an abundance of what he wants to do in our hearts and in our lives. Now, in 1 Kings chapter 17, the Bible tells us that Elijah prophesied unto Ahab. Let me give you a little information. This fiery-eyed Tishbite by the name of Elijah is a man of God. He is a prophet of power. And whenever he speaks, God backs his word up. He prophesies to Ahab. Ahab, mind you, was the most wicked king to ever sit upon the throne of the nation of Israel. The scripture says that Elijah cries out and said, it's not going to rain until I say so. Let me just tell you, if you're going to prophesy about rain, then you need to have something more than most meteorologists have, all right? You need to know what you're talking about. He said it will not rain, and it did not rain. But now we find him sometime later up on a mount called Carmel, and he is now saying, I hear the sound of not a sprinkle, not a little piece of rain here or there, but I hear the sound of an abundant downpour. I tell you, the sound of abundance brings conviction to our heart. You understand there's a difference between opinion and conviction. How many of you have ever had either of those? You ever had an opinion about things? And then how many of you have had a, a real conviction about things? Now, as a holiness preacher to a holiness church, let me just tell you, we're known for convictions, all right? We're known for preaching our convictions. Go ahead and say amen to that. And I just want to tell you that I, I, I know that there are those who would say you ought not to have any convictions, to which I just want to say you need to have some real conviction about the things of God. You need to get to a place where you know who you are and whose you are and you know how you got where you are and you know how to stand up in the face of adversity. You know how to say God is true and everyone else is a liar and I'll stand on the promise of God and when the smoke clears the air and that debris hits the ground, I'll be standing right here because I've got conviction. Amen. Because I believe and I know whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed unto him against that day. Now an opinion is what you believe based on what you know at the time. When you obtain more information you may be willing to change your opinion about something. Alright? However conviction is based on what God knows. And since God knows everything you don't have to change your conviction about God and about the things of his Holy Spirit. Now, there are times when we've said, well, I've got some convictions when we really had opinions and we learned some things and we changed our opinions, all right? Then we were accused of uh, becoming liberal and backsliding and walking away from truth and denying the faith and becoming infidels and apostates and what have you. And I just want to tell you that you have to understand the difference between opinion, which is what you believe based upon what you know at the time, versus conviction, which is based upon what God himself knows. I've got some convictions. I want to preach a few of them to you tonight. Buckle up, all right. I just want to tell you that I have conviction in my heart. I have a conviction that the Bible is the revelation of God. That every word of God is true. That God's word is forever settled in heaven. That not one jot or one tittle is going to pass away until it is all fulfilled. I have a conviction that the Bible is the indisputable, irrefutable, unchangeable, unalterable, eternal, ever living, everlasting, life changing word of the Almighty God. I have a conviction that there is only one God who manifests himself in three distinct persons that is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I have a conviction that there is only one name under heaven given among men whereby we can be saved. I have a conviction that Jesus Christ is the only hope of salvation. 
I have a conviction that God is able to supply all of my need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I have a conviction tonight that I am more than a conqueror through him that loved me and gave himself for me. I have a conviction that if my friends or my family forsake me, that the Lord will lift me up. My conviction tonight is that weeping may last all night long, but joy will greet me first thing in the morning. I have a conviction that if I wait upon the Lord, he will renew my strength like that of the eagle. I'm convicted tonight that if I delight myself in the Lord, he will give me the desires of my heart. I have a conviction that my God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that I ask or even think. Joshua had conviction whenever he stands up and said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. David had conviction when he's facing Goliath, the giant from Gath, and he said, you come against me with sword and spear and shield, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. The three Hebrew children had conviction whenever they cried out and said, our God is able to deliver us, but if he does not deliver us, we will not serve your gods, and we will not worship this image in the wilderness. Mordecai had conviction when he goes down and talks to Esther and said, honey, it may very well be that God has brought you to his kingdom for such a time as this. The apostle Paul had conviction that day when he's standing on top of that boat, and he said, this ship is going down, but not one life is going to be lost. I'm glad to tell you that there are some convictions that you can have. You can get a hold of this book and you can stand upon the promises of God. Amen. I believe it was Haven or Ravenhill. One or the other said something about some folks think they're standing on the promises when they're just sitting on the premises. All right. But know this. You and I can stand upon the promises of Christ my King through eternal ages. Let his praises ring glory in the highest. I will shout and I will sing because I'm standing on the promises of God. The sound of abundance will bring some conviction to your heart. But if you and I are going to get to that place where we have the abundance that our God has promised for us, then we must learn to be committed to the process even in the time of lack. We have to come to that place that we are committed to the process. How many of you have ever experienced some lack in your life? Something was missing. Something was just simply not there. And I know that messes uh, uh, the, the theology up of a lot of uh, neo-Pentecostals, a lot of charismatic brothers, but I just want to tell you that, that uh, this book is not simply a book to make you wealthy overnight. It's not simply a book to tell you how to get ahead in life and, and to be able to, to get hold of all the stuff in this world that you'd like to possess and own. The Bible tells us that, that a man's life really doesn't consist of the abundance of the stuff that he has, but rather our life is, is joy and it is peace, and our life is, is joy in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now, now the scripture tells us here that, that in this process that there's a man who is committed to the process process even though there is lack. There's no water, but he's committed to the process. Sometimes in your life, you're going to face a lack. There will be times whenever whatever it is that you're needing is not available to you. It's not readily in your hand, and God wants to teach us some lessons during those moments of our life. There's some things you don't learn on the mountain, you only learn in the valley. Some things you don't learn when everything's going well, you only learn when everything's gone wrong. There's some things that you don't learn about yourself or friends or family or even God. When you're healthy, you only learn some things whenever the doctor says, we really don't know what's wrong, and we're running tests and, and it doesn't look very good. That's when you can learn some of the deep things about God, yourself, others, and the scriptures. But Elijah had prophesied that there was no rain. And now he himself will experience the result 
of his own prophetic word. There was no rain. But just because there's a lack of water does not mean that there's a lack in God because God speaks to his servant and said, I want you to go down to a brook and there I've commanded the birds to feed you and they're going to provide for you. So every day he's got fresh water from the babbling brook and the blackbirds are swinging down low with some fresh provision and God was taking care of his servant. But eventually the birds stopped coming and the brook dried up. And sometime when you stand upon your conviction, you will find out whether or not you are committed to the process. Sometimes you open your mouth and declare what you believe or who you are or what you're trusting or how you've been praying and all of a sudden you've got an opportunity to be able to stand there and find out, am I really committed to this process? Am I surrendered to him? Am I sold out to him? Am I going to love him and live for him no matter what I face? You see, there are things that dry up in our lives. Sometimes your finances dry up. And sometimes your health dries up. How many of you are learning that? I'm 57 years old. It sure is different than 40 was. I can tell you that. Someone told me that many years ago. They said, life begins at 40. I said, it changed. That's all I can tell you. It just changed in a big way. But sometimes your health dries up, your job dries up. Sometimes even in Pentecostal churches, the anointing of God dries up. Our spiritual power dries up. And we go through the motions and prayer lines. And it's just empty hands on empty heads and nothing's happening. And everybody's going home the same. In the days of Abraham, there was a lack of faith. But he kept on looking for a city that had foundation. And in the days of Samuel, there was lack of vision, but Samuel saw things that others didn't see, and he heard things that others could not hear. In the days of David, when Goliath breathes out his threatening blast, there's a lack of courage, but David says, is there not a cause? And he was willing to go out and cry out the same God who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear. He will deliver me from the hand of the uncircumcised Philistine. In 2 Kings chapter 4, there's a widow woman and there's a lack of money. You know how that the scripture teaches that her husband was a preacher and he took out a loan, a mortgage, something. He borrowed money and what he had for collateral were two sons. And so they now are standing good for that note. No problem except the preacher died and he still doesn't have enough money to pay off the loan. And so the, the creditors are coming to take the boys in to servitude and, and they're going to become his, his bond slaves. But God would not see it to be done that way. And so you know the story how then the prophet shows up and says to the widow, what do you have? She said, I've got, I've got a bottle that's got some oil in it. And he said, you send these boys out. If they don't want to become slaves, they'll, they'll go and they'll borrow every vessel they can find. And he said, you tell them them to bring vessels and not just a few and they came back and he began to pour that oil and every time there's an empty he fills it up, puts a cork in it, hands it over to the boys. Eventually it's all done because there are no more empty bottles or jugs or, or jars. He said you fellas go down to the marketplace, sell it get as good a price as you can. Go pay off the note. You come back and you and your mama live till better days come. I'm telling you that God knows how to take care of his people, if we will remain committed to the process, even in the time of lack. In the days of Daniel, there was a lack of prayer, but Daniel kept on praying morning, night, and noon. In the days of Gideon, there's a lack of courage, but Gideon rises up and he takes 300 and he is able to go and bring victory for the name of our great God, Jehovah. In the days of Jesus, there's a lack of food. But Andrew cries out and said, there is a lad here. He's got a sack lunch. It's just a little fish and a little bit of bread. It's not much among so many. But I hear a songwriter in the wings beginning to hum. Little is much when God is in it. There may be a lack, but God is not suffering from the lack. At the wedding in Cana of Galilee, the scripture teaches us that they lacked wine, but Jesus turned the water into wine. The lack that is surrounding us has nothing to do with us. It is a learning process. It is a teaching moment. It has nothing to do with us and it certainly is not an indicator that God lacks anything. The question that must be 
past, whenever you and I are experiencing lack in whatever it may be, is this. Will you stay committed? Will you remain consecrated? If you don't have money, will you still tithe? If you don't have a lot of strength, will you give the best strength that you do have? If you don't have much time, will you give some time to the cause of the Lord Jesus? If you don't have some food, will you give what you've got to God first? You remember how when the prophet gets down to the to the brook and it dried up and the, and the ravens stopped coming and God sent him down to Zarephath. He said, I've commanded a widow woman to, to uh, feed you there and to take care of you. She's committed to the process and she gives what she really doesn't have to give away. You have to ask yourself the question, when the church goes through lack, don't let this rip you out of your frame, but sometimes local churches go through some dry spells. Sometimes they go through experiences where attendance falls off a little. They sometimes go through those experiences where it's just not as lively and the, and the singers just don't seem to have it one service and the preacher doesn't seem to have it one service. And, and we just go through the motion and we think, oh man, it sure was dry and sure was dreary and not much happening. The question at that point is not where should I go to church now? The question is, am I going to remain committed to my church? Am I going to go through this test? Am I going to remain consecrated? Some of you remember the days of black and white television. How many of you are old enough to remember those good old days? There's some young folks here didn't have a clue. They, they didn't know that we used to talk on a telephone that had a black cord running to the, to the wall. All right, They didn't know that there used to be a day when some of you were on party lines. You pick up the phone and you could hear two or three folks on there having a conversation. And you were listening in, but the truth is they listened in on you too. But the, know, know this. That, that there was a day in the black and white television days that at midnight or, or thereabout, they would put, in our part of the country anyway, they'd put on this screen. And it looked like this big chief tablet Indian in full headdress. And then you would hear this god-awful noise. And that was the signal that they were signing off their air. They were not going to broadcast. There was a day, believe it or not, boys and girls, that television did not last 24-7. All right? And the news didn't. That's a whole lot of subject on another on another night. But, but know this, that whenever that happened, here's what would, what would take place. They would end the broadcast day. But there were also times that they would sound that signal and they would say, this is a test of the emergency broadcasting system. This is a test. It is only a test. It is not an actual emergency. If it were an actual emergency, you would be notified with additional information, yada, yada, yada. And so we find that this, what you're going through, it is not as big a crisis as the devil's trying to tell you. And the devil is not as powerful as he wants us to think he is. It's a test. It's only a test. Our God is trying to prove something to us about himself. He's trying to teach us something that we can't learn when everything's going our way. And so whatever it is, I know this, I have some conviction and I'm committed to the process. And in the midst of lack, I'm willing to make a contribution. I'll contribute my very best even in the midst of lack. That's exactly what happened when Elijah the Tishbite got down to Zarephath you remember the story how that he arrives and the, 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 the blackbirds have stopped and the, and the meat is no longer there, the brook is not there, the fresh water is not there. And, but God said, I've commanded a widow. Of all people, God's going to use a widow to take care of his servant. Now, the prophet gets to town. He arrives, and, and uh, this is Snyder's loose translation. Okay, I, I, I just see things and I ask questions and um, but when I, when I see him walk up into the yard, the Bible said that she's gathering sticks. She's got a son. My brain wants to say, it's a young boy. My brain wants to say, to be sure, that's not a grown man's son letting his mama stand out in the yard picking up sticks when he's able-bodied to do it for her. Can somebody say amen to that? That just makes good sense to me. So I'm going to tell you, you, you say, you can't prove that by the Bible. You can't disprove. So I'm going to tell you, maybe this is a young widow, and she's got a young child. And the preacher gets to town, and he says, widow, would you make me a cake? I'm hungry. And I can hear her 
as she, as she kind of cocks her head back and said, Preacher, I, I just want to tell you something. I love God, but you're asking the wrong woman to give you something to eat. I've got one handful of meal in my barrel in the house, and I've got one last measure of oil in the bottle, and here's our game plan. I'm gathering sticks to build one last fire in that stove, and I'm going to mingle the oil and the meal, and I'm going to make one cake, and my son and I are going to eat that cake, and we're going to wait till death comes over us. That's all there is to it. And you know what he said? He said, would you make me a little cake first? Here's the, here's the truth of it. He is giving her an opportunity to make contribution to God, even in the time of her lack. It's not that he doesn't care. It is not that he disregards her plight and her affairs. It is not that he is, is without compassion toward her. You see, in those days, in that economy, when the man of God arrives, everybody assumed this is God who just showed up. And so what she would do for, his, for God's servant, she is doing for God. And so the servant is saying to her, give me a little cake First, it is God saying, make contribution. Stay committed to the process. Stand on your conviction. I have never forgotten you. I have never failed you. I have never forsaken you. You are carved in the palm of my hand. You belong to me. I will take care of you. And so the scripture is very clear that now she goes in and she, she can see she's going to make him a cake. But isn't that what God asks of us to give him our first fruit in whatever it is? Let me just talk to you tithing for a moment. All right. I believe that God has sanctified the tithe and has hallowed it and set it apart for himself. That means the first fruit, the first tenth of our increase, God has already put his name on a tag and said, that belongs to me. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. Heard a, man, a banker years ago teaching a class to some young folks who were needing some help in making out budgets and finding out how to, to handle finances in early adult, young adulthood life. He said, do you think it is remotely possible? Can you imagine that it's God's will for you to live in a house that costs you so much money that you're going to say you can't afford to tithe? I'm sitting back there not saying a word. I'm an invited guest, but my heart's shouting, amen, preach that again, you know. And, and he said, do you think, is it possible, do you really think God wants you to drive a car that costs you so much money that you're going to say, I can't afford to tithe? Because of what it costs me to pay my mortgage and, and drive this fancy car. That's good preaching. We're not shouting right now. But I just want to tell you, God has a way of getting a message across to us. He said the first fruit belonged to him. And so the preacher said, Widow, if you just give God that first cake, everything's going to be all right. She went in the house. You know the story. She reaches. She pours the oil in the bowl. She puts the handful of meal out of the barrel. She makes the cake, gives it to the preacher. You know that little boy is hungry, and he's saying, Mama, I want something to eat. She did what you would do. I'm going to show you, sonny boy, there's nothing left in here. I gave it to God. We're having to trust. We're having to believe. We're committed to the process. We're standing on our conviction, and we're going to make contribution. We just gave what we had to contribute. And she goes back over there, and lo and behold, she has somehow mismeasured. There is a little bit more meal and a little bit more oil, and she makes another cake and he eats it and he's hungry again and she finds another handful and another measure and it continued that way. That barrel never did fill up and run over but it never ran out. Hallelujah. I'm glad to tell you that God knows how to come through for us. He knows how to provide abundantly for us and I rejoice and give him praise for that. Amen. You see, some folks would look around and say, well, if my bank account doesn't have have X number of dollars in it. Why? I'm just thinking God's not coming through for me. If you've got the money in the account, when you have to write the check, then rest assured God's coming through for you. Amen. Brother Tim, years ago, I, I've told very few people about this in my, in my life. Years ago, I had a, a need. God came through for us with a, 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 a 33 foot class A motor home for my family to, to use. We had, we had some indebtedness on it. We had gotten down to the last $5,000. That You know the life that, of an evangelist. You, you don't like to carry debt that you don't have to carry. 
And so I've got that, and I'm praying about it, and I'm asking, oh, God, would you work this thing out? I'm in Lexington, North Carolina at the First Pentecostal Holiness Church. We've had the revival, and we have just packed up, going on our directions to the next place. I've climbed under the wheel of that big motorhome. Here comes a car off of US 64. I don't know who it is. To this day, I don't know the man's name. He gets out. I climb out from under the wheel, went to the side door. He said, I just passed the church. He said, I don't know you. You don't know me, but God sent me back here. And God told me to bring you an offer. And he told me exactly how much to bring. Okay, I'm, I'm seeing a five and three zeros. All right, that's what, that's what my brain is telling me. And, and I, I'm just I'm doing flip-flops in my spirit. And my heart's rejoicing because God has come through. I just know it. And that man put something in my hand. It's, it's just a piece of paper. So I know it's a check and I know it's the exact amount. You know, you know how, how we work this thing out. It's no change. It's not dollar bills. It's not coins. It's a check for the exact amount of money that I need. He, he goes on. I thank him and bless him. And as soon as he got away... I couldn't wait for him to get gone. I wanted to see what was in my hand, but I was polite. I did wait. As soon as he got in his car and, and I knew he couldn't see what I was doing, I opened it up and it was a $1 bill. And I don't mind telling you, my heart kind of went, what, what's this all about? I, I, I need 4999 more of these, God. And at that moment, God whispered into my spirit and he said, I'm going to take care of you. One dollar at a time. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And at that point, God delivered this preacher from ever having to sit back and really get bent out of shape over finances. I just knew if I do what he wants me to do the way he wants me to do it, he has put himself on the hood and he'll take care of it. Amen. Now, I'm glad to tell you that's what happened with the widow. She made a contribution in the midst of her lack and God proved himself to her. You see, Abel made a contribution. He gave his best lamb and Abraham gave his best son and Moses gave his best stick and Ruth gave her best life and David gave his best praise and Mary gave her best perfume and the father gave his only son and the son gave the only life that he had and Simon Peter went to church one day and a, and a crippled man looked at him and said, Preacher, can you spare a dime? He said, I don't have what you're looking for but I got what you need. Silver and gold I don't have but what I do have, I, I gladly give it to you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And with that, he picks his hand up and he rises and strength comes into his bones and he goes jumping and leaping and praising God. Why? Because he made contribution. He gave himself to God. He put his faith in God. Sometimes that's all you've got to contribute. But you'll say, God, I've got faith and I'm reading the word to create more faith and I'm going to contribute my faith faith and believe you to take care of the need that I have. Whatever you have need of, God has plenty of it. Amen. No matter what, you give God your best and you trust God for the rest. When the enemy comes against you, instead of getting discouraged and despondent, why not just give God your best praise? Amen. Yeah. Some yeah. of my best praising has been whenever I didn't really have reason, according to some folks, to praise God for anything. But some of my best shouting, some of my best dancing has been whenever I was just making a contribution to the Lord. I said, God, your credit's good with me. I'm going to praise you right now. I don't see it coming to pass, but I know it's going to happen. I'm going to praise you on credit. Amen. I'm going to praise you now as though it has happened. It might be if you and I could praise God for saving our loved ones. It might be that God would just begin to pour on the spirit of conviction on their heart. And maybe if we just praise him when we pray that God would move and grant to us the desires that we stand in need of. When the spirit of fear comes upon us, instead of cowering down, why not just give God our best glories and our best praises and just honor him and extol him and sing. You may say, I can't sing. Sing anyway. Amen. Whatever you can do, make your contribution unto our God. In the season of life, don't hold back. Give what you have to God. Do you understand? I want to clarify this. You understand we're not talking about just money tonight. 
about. We're, we're talking about whatever it is that our need consists of. We give whatever we have under God and we trust Him to meet the need. If what, if what I have is not enough to meet my need, then perhaps what I have should become my seed. All right, don't don't fall out with me here. All right, I, I'm 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 not a neo Pentecostal. I'm not the, what what many refer to as charismatic. I'm just a, a, a classical Pentecostal who believes what I read in that book. Yeah. All right, and I, I believe the Bible says there's no good thing that He'll withhold from those who walk uprightly. Amen. I believe that God will supply all of my need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus, not out of His riches, but in accordance to His riches. Amen. And He owns the cattle of a thousand and hills and the earth is the Lord's and all of the fullness thereof. So what I find in this is that perhaps God wants me to follow a biblical principle and teaching of seed time and harvest time and if what I've got is not enough to take care of the need, maybe God wants me to sow it into his labor and into his kingdom and just simply believe that as I sow, so shall I reap. If I sow sparingly, I'll reap sparingly. But if I will so abundantly, I'll reap abundantly. If I sow to my flesh, I'll reap corruption. But if I sow to the Spirit, I'll reap life everlasting. Glory to His name. I'm glad to tell you that you and I must make contribution even in the time of our lack. But you have to be willing to accept correction. Now understand, we're following this pattern here. When Israel is, is under the drought, they don't have any water. They, they, the food supplies are running short. And then you hear this prophet come on the scene. And he says, how long hold you between two opinions? Isn't that great King James language? And all he's saying is, is why can't you make up your mind? How long are you going to wait before you make up your mind? He said, if God is God, then let's serve him. And if Baal is God, then let's all bow down and serve him. I've come to an awareness. Many times in, in recent years, I've looked at my wife or other people that, that I'm laboring with and ministering to, and I just make the observation. I said, this thing either works or it doesn't. God's word is either true or it's not. God is either able or he is incapable of supplying the need that we're bringing to him. And so I'm convinced because I have learned from my experience that God's word is true. Amen. And that it really does work. And so whenever I read through this, I come to an awareness that, that they had to experience some correction. And sometimes you and I have to be corrected. Amen. Take a little poll here. How many of you correct your children? Don't you wish everybody would? <laughs> don't, don't. My dad corrected me. My mom corrected me a few times. Um, dad convinced me, take a little time out here. Okay, this, is, this is mixed, believe it or not. Believe it or not, I've told one lie in my life. You say, I don't believe that. You'd be wrong. There's one time in my life that I knew what I was saying was not true. And I told the lie to my father and I stuck to it. And he gave me every opportunity to back up, reconsider, rethink, get out of it. But I held on. And he convinced me that I never wanted to do it again. <laughs> All right, that's, that's, that's my dad. He's in heaven. And if he heard that, he'd be saying that's exactly right because I did not want my son to be a liar. All right, I want to tell you something. I have learned some things. You have to be corrected in life. And God loves you enough to correct you. When you are wrong, and let's just be honest with ourselves, sometimes you're wrong. Amen. Don't take offense to that, but you just need to be told that. All right, sometimes you need to be told you're wrong. Sometimes I need to be told I'm wrong. Sometimes the spirit that we operate in is wrong. Sometimes the thing that we were doing is the wrong thing to do. We have to be willing to accept correction and submit to God's divine order. You see, when he asks how long halt you between two opinions, he is saying to them, you need to experience some correction. The Bible said that a son whom God loves, he will chasten and he will correct that son. If we do not allow God to correct us, 
we make ourselves to be illegitimate children. All right? The Bible gives to King James gives us a different word. You read that. But, but know this, that if we do not allow him to correct us, then we make ourselves to become illegitimate. And we understand that the, genes, the, uh, the generality of that is an illegitimate child usually has a relationship with the mother but not with the father. All right? Oftentimes has the mother's name but not the father's name. All right? I'm not saying every time, but usually and often. If I don't let God correct me, I find myself in a relationship with the church, which is my mother, because the Holy Spirit moved upon the, the church. Zion travailed. And God birthed me into this thing. But I have a relationship with my mother, the church, and I bear her name. But I don't have a relationship with my father. I want to have a relationship with my father in such a way that I know what it's like to feel his hand come and touch me on my head. I want to know what it's like to have him put his arms around me and pick me up and in his embrace and draw me close. I want to know what it's like for him to kiss me on the side of the face. I want to know what it's like to hear his voice whispering deep things and sweet things down into my spirit and my inner man. God grant to us that we will allow him to correct us. Samuel had to correct King Saul when Saul said, I've done the will of God. Then what does it mean? I hear all these sheep out here. You were supposed to kill every one of them. You have not obeyed the Lord. Samuel had to correct King David when David is angry and says, the man who has done this thing is worthy of death. And Samuel said, thou art the man. You see, there are times when a parent has to correct a child. Hang on. There are times when a pastor has to correct a parishioner in a church. There are times when a conference bishop has to correct conference ministers. But it is all a part of the divine order. The divine order was placed in its order in that an altar is repaired. It's put back in its original condition and there the altar is built and the, the wood is put there and the scripture said the meat is laid in order and he calls for 12 barrels of the most precious commodity in the region and he pours four barrels of water and four barrels of water. Now ultimately 12 barrels of water and the ditch has been filled up round about it and he prayed a simple 63 word prayer and the fire of the Lord fell upon the altar and that kind of fire not only licked up the wood and the meat and drank up the water but it ate the dust. Read it in the scripture. It licked up the dust. You talk about a hot burning fire. God send a fire down upon us and give us correction and let us cry out the Lord. He is God. We will love him. We will serve him. We will give our all to him. The Bible teaches us that if we're going to get to that place of abundance, now the fire fell, but that's not what they're needing alone. They're needing rain. They're, they're needing something of long lasting value. And so the scripture teaches us that the prophet has now looked around, the fire is there, and everybody's on their face crying out, Jehovah is God. And he looks around, and he, he borrows a sword. He, he, he takes the sword, and he kills 450 false prophets. That would empty out a whole lot of pulpits today, wouldn't it? And the prophet there, with blood still dripping off of the sword's edge and point, he turns around to King Ahab. Done exactly what Ahab did. You either repent or run. One of the two. You're not going to stand there and argue with a man with a bloody sword. And he said, it's time for you to get to Jezreel. Don't let the rain stop you. I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. You see, in the process of all this, he now understands we've got to be complete in our faith. So, you know, the, Elijah looks to his servant. He said, go down. I want you to go to the ocean. I want you to look toward the sea and bring me a weather report. He runs, he returns, there's nothing, go again. Goes, comes, nothing. Let's be honest, by the time he gets there five or six times and goes through that, most of us have already given up. 
We're praying and we, we've come to the Lord five or six times and we've decided, no, it's just not my night. This is not when God's going to sanctify me. I'm not going to get the Holy Ghost tonight. I don't guess the Lord's going to heal me tonight. I don't guess the Lord's going to work things out in my marriage tonight. I suppose we're going to go home just like we came in and nothing's going to change. But that's not the way we must look at it. We must be complete in our faith. And he sent his servant the seventh time. And on the seventh journey back, he's coming with a different step to him. He has seen something that time that he did not see the other times. And he comes back with the weather report and I hear him say I saw a cloud and it looked like the hand of a man amen now let's let's talk a moment about the numbers I, I don't have time to deal a lot with numerology but the number seven means something all right that's not just a lucky number that's not just a number that the folks who roll dice are hoping to come up with seven is a number that speaks of completion and so it is he went the seventh time it is now completion our faith must be complete we must be mature in our faith we need to grow up in our walk with Jesus and experience some real maturity some completion some perfection if you want to use that King James term the scripture says to us that this man comes back and when he said I see the hand a cloud looked like the hand of a man you know what he's saying he, he, he hold your hand up there you see those five fingers he said I, I, I brought you a complete weather report and I saw a cloud like the hand of a man now notice something out of the sea came the cloud oftentimes in scripture a large crowd is considered and referred to as a sea. Out of that sea came a cloud like a man's hand. Out of the large crowd, out of God's saints around this world, out of the church, rises up a cloud like the hand of a man. And Paul said he gave some to be apostles and some to be prophets and some to be evangelists and some to be pastors and teachers. And what are those ministry gifts for? For the perfecting of the saints. To bring us to maturity. To bring us to completion. And so it is that God raises people up in the kingdom to, with their gifts to bring us to spiritual maturity and perfection. Hallelujah. And so it is that God in this week, God may want to drop a gift in you. God may want to just use you to exercise some spiritual gift to help complete and mature and perfect the body of Christ. That's why he says in Ephesians that we have come unto a perfect man through those ministry gifts. And in Hebrews, he said, let's go on to perfection or to completion. Elijah looked toward the sea and up out of the sea comes a hand, there arose a little cloud. The moment you see the cloud, you can begin to react. Amen. Now notice something. Before Elijah saw the cloud, he says, I hear the sound of an abundance. That teaches us that faith comes by hearing, which always precedes sight and what we can see. Oh, I just can't see it, but can you hear it? I just don't see it, but can you believe it? Faith comes by hearing and Hearing comes by the word of God. So let me get alone with God. Let me spend time in his word. Let his word create faith within my human spirit. And let me believe God, though I can't see it. I can believe God for healing when I'm dying. I can believe God for salvation whenever I'm lost. I can believe God for a miracle when nothing is going right. Because faith is that that brings me to a place of maturation where I can come to believe. Believe him and trust in him. Amen. I'm about to feel like preaching to you, and I need to be wrapping this thing up. But know something tonight that God has plenty of what you and I stand in need of. He has plenty of it. David heard the sound of a going in the top of the mulberry trees, and that's when he moved. Solomon heard the sound of praise when he dedicated the temple. Though the day of Pentecost, there was a sound of a rushing mighty wind that filled the whole house. John on the Isle of Patmos heard a voice like the sound of a trumpet. It sounded like the voice of many waters. And there's coming a day when we're going to hear 
hear the sound of a trumpet blow. Hallelujah. And we'll hear the armies of heaven returning in clouds of heaven and power with great glory. The lightning is flashing. The thunder is crashing. What is it that you stand in need of tonight? Some of you need healing. Some of you have lost companions. Some of you have wayward sons and daughters. Some of you have grandchildren that are, that are spaced out on drugs and, and substance abuse. Some of you are, are struggling with, with, with situations at, at home. Some of you have problems on the job. Some of you are concerned about paying your bills. Some of you don't know how to handle the pressure that you are under. I've come to tell you that he will keep you in perfect peace. If you will keep your mind upon him. He has plenty of what you need. Here's the question. What do you need? What do you need? God has plenty of that. Do you really think he could help me? If he can't help you, he can't help me. If, he, if he's limited in what you need, then how can I believe him to take care of what I stand in need of? If you have him, you have everything that you need. Stand to your feet with me, please. All over. Father, hear us now as we come to, to enter into this time of seeking you and, and ministering for you in these lives around this altar. We just simply come to say, have your way. Come, Lord Jesus, and let faith rise up and be strong in our hearts tonight. Help us to believe your word, to stand upon your promise. Grant to us that we will walk in these steps, leading us to a place where there is Abundance in the name of the Lord Jesus, I pray. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I pray. I want to ask you all over this place before we do anything else, would you take just a moment and I want you to think about what it is that you're needing from God? I want you to think about what it is that you're asking God to do, whether it's in your life or the life of someone else, but whatever it is, I want you to think upon that for just a moment. Think about that lack. Think about that shortage, that, that shortfall. Think about that that is missing. Think about that that is dry. Think about the brook that just ran out. Think about the, the raven that stopped coming. Think about how you had everything figured out and everything worked out and suddenly the plan just fell apart. Think about that for just a moment. What is it that you're needing from God? And then I want you now to cup, as it were, your spiritual hand to your spiritual ear and hear the word of the Lord can you hear the sound of an abundance can you hear the clap of thunder can you see the lightning as it flickers and dances across the sky can your faith believe that God is going to answer your cry tonight can you believe that God wants to do good things in your life can you believe that God wants to forgive where you have failed that God wants to feel where you are empty can you believe that God wants to heal where you are hurting there is a sound of an abundance from wherever you are any place in this room on the main floor or yonder in the balcony whatever it is that you have need of would you bring that need to stand in this altar tonight step out to the near aisle wherever you are Make your way down that aisle. I want you to come into this altar. And by your coming, you're saying, I'm bringing my need to the altar. I'm bringing my problem to the altar. Can you do that? How many of you do Facebook? Any of you? I'm going to make a little spiritual thing right here. I, I, I do Facebook for a lot of variety of reasons. It can be wonderful slash horrible all at the same time. But uh, I saw recently where a, a little cartoon the, the preacher had said something to the effect to the congregation, said, bring your pro pick, you know, get your problem, pick up your problem and bring it to the altar. And a woman just picked up her husband and put it over her shoulder and heads right down the aisle. All right, whatever your problem is, bring it. Whatever your need is, bring it. Whatever your lack is, bring that to God. And I challenge you, I encourage you, I implore you to reach up to God to believe that God is a good God. I want to ask a question. How many of you have ever been forgiven of sin? At least one time in your life, God forgave a sin that you committed. All right, you see all this? Then if you've committed a sin that hasn't been forgiven, take courage. God forgives sin. He'll do it for you. How many of you have ever been sanctified? At one point, you may not act like it every day, but, but you've been sanctified at one point in your life. 
then if you're struggling with inbred sin and you're doing what you know you shouldn't and you want to be free and you want to live differently, there's some of these folk can testify that the Lord is a sanctifier. Be encouraged and believe him and let him do that for you. How many of you have ever been filled with the Holy Ghost? Amen. Then if you need the Holy Ghost, be encouraged. God wants to fill you with the Holy Ghost. He has healed some folks. He has blessed some folks. He's provided miracles for folks. And you can believe him. And he'll do that for you. Here's what I want to ask you to do tonight. Would you right where you are, with our focus no longer upon the lack, we're not thinking about the drought. We're thinking about the downpour. We're not thinking about how dry I am, but how wet my spirit is about to become. Because God is going to open up the heavens. Isn't that what he said? Whenever He said, if you'll make the contribution, he, in that case, spoke about tithing. He said, if you'll bring your tithe into my house, just put me to the test and just see if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessing upon you, that there won't be enough room to receive it. God will bless you. Lift your hands in his presence tonight. Uh, cry out to him uh, and let the rain fall upon your spirit. Uh, cry out to him who lives and abides in heaven and let him pour his spirit out upon you tonight. Receive in the name of the Lord Jesus. Don't think about what's wrong. Think about he can make it right. Don't think about how empty but how full you're about to be. Don't think about how sick but how it's going to be a wonderful experience to be healed and be strong and be well again. Don't think about what's gone wrong but rather that he he will make it right. Let your faith be released in a great God in heaven and trust him and believe him. Receive in the name of the Lord Jesus. Receive in the name of the Lord Jesus. I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. It's not just a little bit, but it's a whole lot. It's not just enough to get me by, but it will see me through until this is over and it will will not last forever. Cry out to him tonight. Cry out to him tonight, church. Cry out to him tonight. Right where you are. Right where you are. Believe him. Right where you are. Release your faith in God. Lord, I've read your word. I've read your word. And your word says you're a healer of every kind of sickness and disease. So I'm believing. My faith believes that you are a healer and a miracle worker. I read that you opened up the eyes of blind men. I believe you can heal me. I read that you cleanse lepers and you can heal me. I read that you raised the dead. You're able to touch me tonight. I'm believing tonight. I'm believing tonight. I'm believing tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hang on right, right where you are. I just want to interrupt you a moment. May, may, maybe we need just a little help in believing. How many of you, I asked the questions a moment ago, in general, how many of you have ever had God do something for you? Lift your hand up high. I, 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 don't, I don't mean, you know, just some little piddly thing. I mean, God really came through. God did something wonderful for you. Amen. Would you be willing to help a brother out? a sister out. Could it be in just a moment that you and I could provide the sound of abundance? Could it be that you and I could create the sound and maybe we could just lift up our voice to bless his name. Because God saved me, I want to praise him for saving me. And if I shout about his praise, about his salvation, maybe somebody who needs salvation would be encouraged to believe and say, if God can save that big boy, he can save me too. Amen. Maybe if you'll shout because God has healed you, somebody else will say, I, I hear the sound of an abundance. I, I know what God has done for her. Sister Karen, it might very well be if somebody could hear you lift up your voice, they might say, if God can do that for her, God can do that for me. So I just want to encourage you. Would you just help me to create a little sound of abundance and lift up your voice and praise God for what he did for you. Lift up your voice and shout his praises. Magnify him and glorify him. Lord, I hear a sound of an abundance tonight. And I believe in you that as we lift our voice to create the shout of praise, to create the sound of thunder, in abundance that my brother and my sister will have faith to believe that they can trust and they can receive
intimacy, that they will have healing and strength and victory and joy bells will ring in their hearts again. I hear the sound of an abundance. Bless his name. Bless his name. Would you turn to somebody there? Take hold of somebody's hand. Just sense in my spirit. I, I, I want to ask you to do this. Just, just, just one or two or three of you. Just take hold of hands there next to you. Somebody close by. And I want you to minister to them in such a way. I want us to thank God. Hear me, church. God's credit is good with us. Whatever it is you're praying for, believe that you receive. And he said you'll have what you ask. Let's believe tonight. There's an old sister in my first church told me, don't be afraid to ask largely of the Lord. Ask God for the big stuff as well as the little stuff. If you don't have faith for the big things, then spend time in the Word and let it create faith so you can believe God. But believe Him tonight. Believe Him tonight. Trust Him. Receive from His hand tonight. There is a sound of abundance. Trust Him. Receive. Receive. Believe his word tonight. Really receive to the name of the Lord. Let's give God praise for answering your prayer. Praise God when you pray. When you pray, believe that you receive and you will have what you ask. If I believe I receive, I ought to be grateful. I ought to thank the Lord that he heard my prayer. I ought to lift my voice to sing his praises. I know he heard my earnest prayer. I know he listened when I cried out to him. He saw my tears and put them in a bottle. He caught my prayers and put them in a bowl. I know God was hearing me. And I'm going to praise and magnify and worship him because he has answered me. It's as good as done if I can believe God. It's as good as done if I can believe God. So I'm going to thank you for saving my family. And I'm going to thank you for healing my body. And I'm going to thank you for working a miracle in my behalf. I'm going to thank you by faith. Glory, hallelujah. Glory. Come on, church. Wait on out in the waters tonight. Let the river begin to swell around your ankles and rise up around your knees. Let there be an abundant rain. When the prophet rises up, he outran the chariot and the king's horses. And there was a great rain. And the rivers began to fill up again. Let God fill your rivers. Let God fill your tank. Let him fill your pond. Let him fill your stream. Let God fill us with his presence. Spirit of the living God. <laughs> sound. I don't feel any better, but I hear the sound of healing. I, I, I'm not feeling any better, but I'm, I believe in God for healing. Amen. I'm praying for my lost people, and they're getting more and more ornery every day, but I hear the sounds of salvation, and blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. So I'm going to rejoice because I'm believing God to save them. And bring them into the fold. Glory. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory. Hallelujah. Receive from him. Church, there's a tide that's rising. There's a tide that's rising. I know it because God told me he would. But I know it because I sense it by his own spirit. I sense it in this place. The tide is rising. There's a sound of abundance. 
God loves you as much as he loves anybody. And he's not going to fail you. He's not going to fail you. He's not going to seize an opportunity to let you go down whenever he promised you're going over. Glory, Church, I want to tell you this. God has what you need. I don't know you folks. I, I, I don't know you. Before, before I came here, I, I, I knew about three of you, maybe. Maybe, maybe just two of you. That's all I knew. But I want, to know, I want you to know this. God knows you. And he knows what you stand in need of. He knows what you can handle and what you can't. He knows what you can take and what you can't couldn't hold up on that. Amen. And God doesn't let things come your way that you can't handle. If you'll keep your hand of faith in his, in his powerful hand of, of provision, you can handle anything. Just, just, just don't give up. Just don't, don't, don't release your hold upon him. Just stay committed to the process. Have you got some conviction? I've got, I've got conviction. God's going to see me through. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I've I got stories that if you got any love of God and compassion at all, I could have you in tears. I, I mean, I, I've gone through some stuff. You know, some folks just look at me and say, oh, he, he's so cute. No, I've been through stuff that weren't cute. All right? I mean, I, I've been through some stuff. I've been through some stuff that had me wallowing on the floor, bawling my eyes out, crying, God, how are you going to fix this? Because I don't have a clue. I want, I want to finish something. You're standing, but I've been standing longer than you. So hang on just a moment. I want to finish this, and I'm going to turn the service back to row 10. The need that I mentioned to you about the motor home and the indebtedness, all right, we had, we had paid that thing down to, to that amount of money. God sent the man with a wallet. I still got that wallet here. I don't mind telling you. You, you say, well, you should have spent that. I've got that one. It's in my office this moment in time. I can get my hands on it the moment I walk in that room. And it's a reminder that God's got what I need. But you see, I'd gone through some stuff. But I had determined I was going to keep my hand in his. That I was going to love him and serve him and live for him. I, I had seen the days when, when recreational that's what they're called unless you use them full time in ministry and they're not recreational at all. All right? But I had worn it slim out. Had run up credit cards trying to keep the thing patched while I was on a tour in California years ago. I, I, I could just tell you stories. But I was faithful. This is not about me. I'm just telling you this thing works. I needed to spend money on stuff that had gone wrong. And I kept tithing. I kept believing, and I kept releasing the seed, and I kept giving, and I kept saying, God, someday, somehow, this thing is going to work out because we're doing what you ask us to do. Yeah. And that, that day that I got the dollar, and I confessed to you, honestly, I'm just human, uh, I was disappointed before God whispered what he whispered when 
I saw the one dollar, I'm thinking, I really need 4,999 more of these. The very next week, we arrive at our, at our destination for the next revival. My parents would every day go to the mailbox for me, and they would package up my mail and then ship it on location where we were going to be. We arrived. That's when I had my self shout spell. All right, but, but God showed me something. God taught me something. That he has what you stand in need of. And I say all of that to just tell you, God has what you need. Whatever it is that you need, he's got what you need and then some. Because God is an order in God. Do you believe that? Say amen. 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 The tide's rising, church. I don't know what God's going to do tomorrow night, but I wouldn't. If I was going to miss any night of this revival, it wouldn't be tomorrow night. Amen. I, I would do my best to be in this service tomorrow. And bring somebody with you. And let's just see what God calls us to do next. Amen. God bless you, Pastor. Uh, hadn't this been good tonight? Let's give the Lord another great hand clap. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So much, so much meat, so much word. He's got everything. He has all the power we need. Praise the Lord. Father, thank you so much.